Fireside Chat, Episode 13. Recorded April 16th, 2013. The farm kids are looking good. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. We're back, and it's another episode of Fireside Chat. As usual, I'm with Lucas and Matt, and this week we're all here. How you guys doing? Very good. Awesome. How are you? I'm doing well. This week we had something to be happy about as Flames fans, and that was that the, as I like to call them, the Calgary Heat, or the Abbotsford Flames, ended up kicking Edmonton's ass, which felt pretty good on Saturday. What did you guys think of that 4-1 win? Utter domination. I can't say that I actually watched it because I went to the game the night before against Phoenix and thought, this isn't very fun. It doesn't represent the game of hockey particularly well. Little did I know I was missing the beatdown that would cost Steve Tambellini his job. Yeah. Well, it is on CBC's website, so if you want to watch it after the fact, you can go right ahead. <laughs> oh, I think I might do that. I've got nothing yeah. to do. I hate, it was, it was I hate watching in... games after the fact. I was watching TSN a little while ago, and they were replaying games from our 04 run at like 3 in the morning. I'm sitting there watching one. I'm like, you know, I know how this ends. The next goal comes right about now, and it was right on cue. So I don't know. There's something about watching games after. I can't do it. I, I entirely agree. I even hate watching games PVR'd when I, know, when I don't even know the outcome because it's just sort of like... I know this isn't happening now. I'm just basically watching a movie. I could see the ending. I could see what happens in three seconds if I wanted to. And I really would like to look at TSN for other things. So really, all that watching this PVR game is doing is, I don't know, reinforcing a lie. And I don't accept that. It it, it feels very weird. I don't like it. I think the impressive thing about the game was not just that the Flames beat the Oilers 4-1. I mean, that in and of itself shouldn't be that impressive. But it's, as we all know, the fact that we had, what, half of our fours? Or is it six of the, or th- seven, f- who were essentially farm call-ups? And a lot of our top guys, like Tange, were sitting out. Kipper sitting out. So, to me, that's the real impl- impressive part, is that we can bring these farm guys up and still be a dominating team. Against the well, Oilers. Thanks. Well, that's uh, part of uh, what I was mentioning in the article I wrote a couple weeks ago where um, the Flames have a good group of the support players already in the system, and you're seeing what happens like in that game when you have good leadership types in your rookie group because... You know, you, you look at the Oilers and they have the skill, but they don't have any leaders on the lower part of their team. They don't and have anything on the lower part of their team. No, and that's, you know, unless their superstars take over the game, like, they have nobody to support them, and that's how the Flames kick their ass. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, hold the phone. Are, are you telling me that... Bottom six players, Sean Horkoff and Ryan Smith, do not, in fact, supply leadership? Is that what you're no. telling me? Yep. Entirely. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> Overpaid. <laughs> uh, let's give Lucas a minute to absorb this and soak it in. I'm, I'm just... That's $33 million well spent. The I'm... man wearing the sea apparently doesn't give leadership, according to Matt. Well, I don't know. I, here's the thing. If you draft first overall three straight years and you're captain for all those teams, wouldn't you be... Well, it's not all your fault. Wouldn't you be like, look, clearly I'm not the guy to captain this pirate ship because we're just getting all of our plunder just jacked at every turn. There, I, I've got no idea how to how to, how to to fight a naval battle. My My... my crew doesn't respect me and ultimately when you know it's us in columbus in the in the dead heat for worst run organization in the nhl for three or four straight years maybe five or six depending on how much you really hate kevin lowe uh 
Maybe you just want to be like, here, someone else can have it. Well, the thing I, I truly love is now um, the former GM of the Blue Jackets is now the assistant GM of the Oilers again. <laughs> uh, Housen? Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, all, all the success he just had. Just reinforcing the, you know, suck them. Well, to say nothing of Housen, Craig McTavish is the GM. Like, The Oilers why? have this thing they do and it's like they like to recycle i mean if you look at their management and their coaches everyone on that team used to be an oiler i mean you've got who for assistant coaches you've got kelly bookberger steve smith um all these guys that used to be oilers and it's the same way it seems in the office now it's like oh we have this guy used to be our coach let's just bring him back as the uh as the gm because that's what we love to do i know like if you look back at their o five o six run, like that they had uh, Smith, Horkoff, and Hemsky as three of their main players, and they're still on the team. You know, Smith went for a little travel boat, but is Patty Quinn still with that organization? That's the man I'd make GM. No, he, he he's not there. But uh, it, it, I do think it's interesting that an organization called the Oilers is so intent on recycling people. <laughs> You'd think they'd be like, screw it, carbon tax this, and just maybe that's how they get in their arena. Carbon taxes. Oh, maybe it's like, look, we're not paying our executives anything. Craig McTavish is making sixty-five thousand dollars to come in and do this job. Scott Housen is being paid in cheese. <laughs> I, I just think it's funny that, you know, we've talked about it. Everyone's talked about it. That This is the year the Oilers had to get done. They have the pieces. Their contracts are right at that sweet spot. If they didn't do it this year, they were in trouble. And they didn't get it done, so now they've got a new GM, and I think they're going to start the rebuild cycle again. Well, the thing is, is that the Oilers sucked at the wrong time. Like, yes, they did have three first overall picks, but those three years, like... Only Hall seems to be a long-term piece. Like, even Yakupov, who's done all right, he's more of a secondary offensive player, not a primary guy. And, like, Nugent Hopkins only has three goals this year. So, you know, like, if they were drafting in years where there was a lot better talent, then they might be further ahead, but... You know, they might have to flush the toilet again and get a bunch of new guys. I'm surprised Kevin Lowe didn't instill himself as GM. He really looked like he wanted to. That was an or at least was, interim GM. That was as awkward a press conference as I've ever seen. And on the basis of that alone, I'm I'm a big fan of firing people for things in a vacuum, but. See, on the basis of that press conference alone, if I was Daryl Katz, I'd be like, uh, you need to not be here tomorrow. Uh, that that was a disgrace. I'm, I'm the only person, uh, there's one person in the league who's got more Stanley Cups than me, and I think I know a little bit about winning. Oh yeah, uh, th- th- those teams you were along for the ride with. Like, I, I don't know, I, I feel like a team with Gretzky, Messier, Curry, Coffee. uh... Other people, Glenn Anderson, uh, Grant Fuhrer. I-, I feel like they're more important to the Euler dynasty than Kevin Lowe, who I don't doubt was useful, but I feel like he was way more replaceable than several of the greatest players to ever play the game. Yeah, and like, undoubtedly Lowe was a good player at the time, but... Like, when you got a team that was as stacked as the Oilers were in the 80s, like, it, it, you could have Chris Butler on the team and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> well, let's not go Let's not go that far. I think Chris Butler is the only player you could realistically expect to have on the roster and torpedo your Stanley Cup chances. <laughs> thing I found funny is when they announced that McTavish was GM, he's the fifth GM since the Oilers have joined the NHL. That so, sounds like a low number to me. It is, considering the amount of times they haven't made the playoffs outside the dynasty years. Larry Gordon, Glenn Sather, Kevin Lowe, Steve Tambellini, and Craig McTavish. 
That is ridiculously low. These guys last for a long time. Like, I mean, Sather is there from 80 to 2000, so that's a long run in, in that job. As we know, most teams go through GMs every two, three years. Lowe is in the role for eight years. They keep their GMs. They they let the GMs go past their expiry date, I think, and that's part of their problem. Yeah, well, the Oilers haven't really had much success during the same period that the Flames have been having difficulties since 89. So, you know, it's one of those things that they really should just clear everybody out entirely, scouting staff, you name it, top to bottom, just everybody out. Because, like, if you look at the last uh, three drafts for them, not one player that they've drafted beyond the number one overall pick looks like they'll be in the NHL. Like, that's embarrassingly bad to me. But Well, I mean, the weird thing with Edmonton is that Edmonton, even when Edmonton gets it right, manages to screw up. Like, okay, you get Chris Pronger, lock him up to a six-year extension or five-year or whatever. As soon as you get him, great. That should set you up as a playoff team for the next five years because Chris Pronger doesn't miss the playoffs. And then all you've reasonably got to do is hold on to him, but you can't even do that. There's something about either your organization or your city or the females that cover your team that make it uh, a requirement that he no longer play hockey there. Then you get three straight first overall picks, and your team still sucks. And it shows no signs of getting better. And the same issues that plagued it when you were drafting the first first overall pick exist today, except you've got a couple shiny toys on offense. Well said. Thank you. I, I hope that we can use the Oilers as a model of what not to do during our rebuild. Well, the thing is, is that we've already seen a different strategy entirely from the Oilers because we've already added the character players like Reinhardt, Horak, etc. into our prospect pool, whereas the Oilers don't have a single player that's like that. Edmonton having no character? No, it can't be. They used to, I would argue, that some player at some point was possessed of character like uh i don't names are escaping me but someone someone will tweet us with an oiler who has character at luke 1701 there you go there's a guy with some character me for example like with the islanders Right, they added a couple of good offensive players somewhat similar to Edmonton. But they also got guys like Matt Martin and that that are character third and fourth line guys and you know, add on the some defense and now they're poised to make the playoffs again. The Islanders have a lot more well rounded roster than Edmonton does. Yeah, and that's my point. And Edmonton they just draft the shiny toy and they have nobody to surround them with. Don't you know you've got to draft best player available, man? Which is always a ridiculous notion to me. You draft the player that you think fits your organization best. Because if everyone drafted best player available, then every single first overall pick would be the best player from that draft. But it's rarely the case. Or at least it's not nearly the case as often as it should be, considering every draft has a first overall pick. Like, Joe Sackick was taken, what, 8th? No, he he might not be 8th, but I know he was taken with Quebec's second first-round pick. One of the best players of all time. Well, well, that also has to do with scouting. <laughs> it does, but I mean, it, it, it just shows that, you know, oh, Seth Jones is best player available. To who? Central scouting. Yeah, but... I don't know. Central Scouting's rankings seem to be an average more than a consensus. Well, yeah, that's what that's what any I think aggregation service is. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, well, okay, yeah. So I, I, I said something really stupid there. But my my point is like best player available. I think my point stands best player available according to who, like 
make your own damn evaluations. I know, like, say, like, Colorado, they need a defenseman, so Seth Jones would be the best player available to them. Yes. Whereas, like, the Flames, they have needs everywhere, so that list might be completely different. Agreed. Mind you, last year the Oilers, I think, undoubtedly needed a defenseman and went out and drafted another forward. Yes, but they're run by stupid people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm looking at the old guys on the Oilers, the Islanders, and the Flames and comparing those kind of 33-plus guys who I think are the character guys when you're trying to rebuild. If you look at the Oilers, we've got Jared Smithson, obviously a keeper, Sean Horkoff, Eric Belanger, and Ryan Smith on forward, and Andy Sutton, who's 38. I can't believe he's 38 already on defense. Does Andy Sutton even play anymore? He's on, he's on the active roster, unless he's uh, he's getting the Babchuk treatment. Yeah, he he's got to be. You know, Anton Babchuk's on the active roster. Like, I haven't seen Andy Sutton play a game all year. So I mean, to me, those aren't great character players for guys. You know, over that kind of thirty three threshold. Where if we look at um, if we look at the Islanders, you've got uh, Eric Bolton, Marty Reisner, Keith Coyne. Uh, Lubomir Vishnovsky, Mark Strait, and even Nabokov is their, one of their goalies over that age. So to me, that's a much better rounded out um, kind of depth forwards, leadership forwards. What do you guys think? It's one of the rare times that the Islanders are doing the right thing. Yeah. And then if you look at the Flames in the same category... Um, we only have a couple guys who are older than that. We've got Steve Bejen at 34, Alex Tange at 33, and Corey Serich at 34, and Mika Kiprasov, who's 36. Well, I think it's all, I think we're all in agreement. Kiprasov's leaving at the end of the year. He's retiring. Yeah. Um, Serich is, as I've said several times, Serich is great if you'd actually bother to play him. He's and, and and use him correctly. He's he is what he is, and he has a role, and he can fill it, and it's very useful on this team. And I'm fine keeping Sarich around. Um, Bejan. Someone said on the forum the other day uh, they were in favor of uh, bringing they, they, their off season moves would include bringing Steve Bejan back on an amateur tryout. Not to myself. What has he done to deserve even an amateur tryout again? Or a professional tryout, just like... When I hear Steve Pajan and amateur tryout, I wonder what the word amateur means. I, I, well, to be fair, that was me misspeaking. He, he'd sign okay. a professional tryout. Okay. Um, he, you know, he's a borderline, fourth-line guy who four checks or whatever. I mean... We talked about him in our first episode, the inaugural version of uh, Fireside Chat, and I said, you know what? I think signing him to a two-way deal was a smart thing because I could see him being a leadership guy in Abbotsford or Utica next year. Um, I could see him being that guy who's the old guy showing the kids how it works down there. Oh, I'm fine if he wants to go to Abbotsford. I don't know what the hell he needs to do on the active roster. There, there's not... There, th- there would be, I would say, not fewer than 30 different guys who would bring more to the table than Steve Beja. I could see him being, like, the 13th or 14th yeah. forward. Yeah, me too. Like, someone that's on the active roster that you have in, like, the practices and all that, but not necessarily playing them every game. Yeah, the guy who travels with the team but plays in an emergency situation. I don't know. Is Steve Beja funny enough to be the guy who travels with the team? I mean... What's he done? I don't think he's being hired for entertainment. Well, they they aren't, but at the same time, you know, Craig Conroy, I'm convinced the only reason he was here is to rub again his head and infuse him with a personality the last couple of years of his career because Jerome is a boring man and Conroy has spark and some soul about him. If he was a fantasy creature, he'd be an elf. And... <laughs> Beijing's got six points this year, two goals, four assists. He's a minus two with 22 penalty minutes. So, I don't know, I think he could play that kind of fill-in, fourth-line energy role. Yeah, um, like he even... hasn't been terrible. You know, he hasn't been spectacular, but he hasn't hurt the team when he's out there. For 525000 I'd keep him around in a 13 or 14 role. 
I don't know. I like. It just seems like I'm looking down at the uh, down the list here. I mean, guys who I would take over uh, Steve Bajan. Let's see. Uh, David Steckel, Brad Richardson, Max Lapierre, uh, Colby Armstrong. Uh, I just give. I I guess to me, I think I give Bajan a little more credit than perhaps he's due. Um, for his performance this year because of his comeback story. I mean, here's a guy that hadn't played pro hockey of any kind in a couple of years, got to try out as a favor, and I think he proved his worth, maybe not again as a top guy, but he proved he can still go at the NHL level. Okay, good good for him. I just, you know, on a, on a team that finishes, is going to finish between 26th and 30th, why do you bring in your bottom of the barrel why do you bring back your bottom of the barrel guys what are they they are instantly because they're the ones that will resign here i know but ever exactly the... like the problem is is that to attract free agents this year it's going to be somewhat difficult unless you're giving them like nearly a million dollars more than they should get so somebody call theo yeah we got a roster spot for him <laughs> That would be good. <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm, I'm all in favor of giving older vets some time here to, and to allow them to mentor kids. But I just, I don't know. Bayesians, you know, need it. I mean, I would think that you know Marty Reisner could be had for a reasonable sum. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, uh, he's 36 years old, plays center, made 1.3 million this year. Uh, Jamie Langenbrunner is 37. Uh, again, David Steckel, uh, God, Nystrom is available. All of these guys I would sign over Steve Bajan, and I think they bring exactly the same thing he would do. He would bring on, you know, leadership capacity, plus they'd be better hockey players. So I don't see the need to bring Steve Bajan back. And I will say right now that I think we would have been better served to have Brad Winchester in the lineup as opposed to Steve Bajan. I I think uh, I, like I said I think Beijing has a place in the roster. I see what you're saying, and you know like Marty Reisner is making 1.25 for the role I would want that player to play. I don't want to pay 1.25. Yeah, but who cares? It's you know it's going to be a one year deal anyway. You're going to have a ton of cap room, so give Marty Reisner 1.3 million or one million or whatever. Like it it doesn't matter. Yeah, oh. I guess it it does it does set a standard for what everyone else is going to get in comparison though. Who yeah. cares? Like, me personally, of the guys that you listed, the only one that I'd actually go out and target would be Nystrom. And, like, I'd even give him $2 million, like, for each of the next three years just to infuse him, his personality, back in the team. Do we know if he left here on okay terms, if he'd want to come back? I'm sure he would. I think, so. uh, I think he just took more money. That was the... Okay. I think the Flames were offering like five hundred thousand dollars less than what he signed for. So yeah, yeah. he he got he, his cap hits one point four million, and the Flames weren't going to touch that for what Eric Nystrom no. was, and nor should they have. But you know what? Given what situation is going to be like in the next uh, few years, yeah, bring Eric Nystrom back. I'm all for that. Yeah, like he's basically what Reinhardt hopes to be so except a winger yeah yeah but you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. that type of guy Mm -hmm. so i'd steal ryan jones from edmonton if you know if it didn't cost too much he looks like he cares most nights I might be alone here, but this is a flame I've always liked, and if we had the chance and the price was right, I'd be okay bringing Chuck Kobasu back. Yeah, I could see that too. He's making one one point two five million this year. If we could bring him back for nine hundred thousand or a million next year, I think he's thirty. He's still got a a lot of career ahead of him. He could be a good bottom six guy. Well, the thing is, though, is that we don't want to have too many. Guys, like, I'd only sign one, maybe two, just due to the fact that we've got guys like Reinhardt, Horak, Boma, Alou, 
maybe Bill Arnold if he uh, leaves with Boston College. Hanowski. Well, let's let's talk about some of those young guys that we've seen this year. Who's impressive to you guys that we've seen called up, especially in the last little bit here? All of them. Max Reinhardt, but especially, but all of them, as Luke uh, said. I'm really liking Reinhardt. When we drafted him, I sort of liked him, but I think he's gained value in a lot of Flames' eyes lately. Now, this could be like Sven Barchi. If you remember, Barchi came in last year, played a great seven games, and didn't live up to that standard this year. Not that I expected him to, but a lot of people did. So, who knows if uh, if Reinhardt is the real deal or a flash in the pan? But Well, realistically, like I'm expecting Reinhardt to be a solid third, fourth line guy moving forward. Like, He's getting prime ice time due to the fact that, like, everybody's hurt or gone. So, you know, he's getting more opportunities than he likely would. But he's doing a good job. So, yeah, if he... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Everyone's, uh, Everyone's acquitting themselves nicely, and I think that we do need to do a little bit of tempering of expectations simply because these are kids who are getting way more ice time than they will be getting next year. But that being said, I don't think that the recipe for successful development of these guys is to slash their ice time too much next year during the during a full 82 game season because they're going to hit their walls they're going to go through their struggles but i think that all these kids should be playing 12 to 15 minutes a night and getting every chance to show what they can do because the actual victories are not nearly as important as the development of the young players and as we saw last night against minnesota uh Berchi has a goal hanowski has a goal reinhardt looks good uh Brody Horak with an assist. Horak with an assist. Like the young guys contribute and you know look like they can hold their own sort of, uh, or more or less. And you know the team. Well, I think that mentality will change around those young guys too because this year some of those guys are getting benched and like Berchu is getting sent down. When this team was telling people our objective is the postseason. So if everyone's resigned themselves that next year the objective is not the postseason, I think you're going to see the young guys handled very differently. Well, like if you look back at uh, Chicago in the 05-06 and 06-07 seasons, they had Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook as their top pairing, and they were playing 24 minutes a night, and they weren't doing very well, either of them. They were prone to defensive lapses like Brody is now, but because they were being thrown out there time and uh, time and again, and if you make a mistake, learn from it and just keep going, then they actually developed into, you know, the best pairing in the NHL when they won the cup. So, you know, they need time to learn, and you know, especially with the Flames targeting players that have good hockey IQ, it seems that like they're more apt to actually learn on the fly like even Hanowski last night he was terrible in the first period but he seemed to be getting better and knowing where to be as the game progressed I I don't even think Hanowski was terrible in the first so much as he was terrified I mean that that that's a that's a pretty big situation to just find yourself thrown into a week after playing college hockey and you know you're spending more shifts than you should uh trying to forecheck against ryan Souter. like i'd i'd be nervous i think even more than that i mean it's not like he's the college player who's getting called up just for a look that's you know been a prospect forever i think anytime he suits up people are going to remember this is what we got back for jerome so there's some added stigma there as well I'm sure he feels that for sure. And I think, you know, the goal last night probably went a long way to just crushing, or not crushing, dissipating a lot of that pressure that both he feels and that the fans are going to put on him. Yeah. Because, I mean, well, if he has success, that's great. You know, he's supposed to. But, I mean, if he, his struggles, the longer he goes goalless or doesn't seem like he quite fits in, the more the city's going to be like, what the hell? This is what we got for Iggy. Well, and the harder it's ever going to be for him to gain, I don't want to say trust, but gain acceptance here. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, last night I think uh, 
went a long way to the city really embracing him. Or the families yeah. really embracing him. Well, he him. actually uh, received the loudest ovation when his name was called during the... Because he was in the starting lineup. And he actually received by far the loudest acknowledgement oh. of any of the players. Awesome. Good for you, Calgary he, Flames fans. And he's signed up now, too. He's on a two-way entry-level contract averaging 900000 a year. So it's not like he's going to go anywhere. He's here at least for, I think, two years. I uh, believe it's just an extra year after this one because this does technically burn. Oh, is it? I, I think so, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, This because he played, even if he was in the AHL, it would have burned the the first year off of that. Because I thought that all entry level deals were three years by default, so I was assuming uh, that this it, was the first one. No, it's um, because of the he's an NCAA player that it's shorter because of his age. So, like that's why Cervenka's contract was only for one year because he's older. So. Okay. And realistically, even if he does like we burn in it a year of his contract but this isn't a player that's going to be demanding a an entry level to Eberly sort of raise you know he's not going to no. go from 900 grand to 6 million and i mean if he does no. great that's awesome but i i would i would rather he goes from 900 grand to 6 million because he's deserved it like if that's what it costs to re-sign him because the guy's getting 40 50 points a year i'm happy with that goals you mean he goals even yeah i guess you're right it would have to be goals for that much money but yeah i mean even if he's just getting 40 points i wouldn't you're right i wouldn't pay him six million but i'd give him a hefty raise if he can even get 40 points yeah and he, as much as like i think his skating was much maligned in the post game conversation last night but he's not slow he's just awkward looking yeah and that's just gonna require some time with the skating coach to get his stride proper yeah, I thought I thought all things considered, he did pretty well. You could tell that at the beginning, he wasn't used to lack the level of compete that is the NHL. You can tell he was used to a slower game, but I thought he ramped up pretty well to meet the demands that were put on him. He did, and the biggest thing that impressed me is that for a guy who was so very clearly uh, just awestruck in the first period, uh, when the puck was on his stick, there was no panic. There was no there was no flash for one, but he would just make the simple safe play, and in comparison to once again our favorite number forty four Chris Butler panicking and uh, crapping his pants when there's nobody within ten feet of him and icing the puck for no reason, uh, it was a refreshing change to see a young player just display that sort of composure even in the face of what I'm sure was a, a monumentally uh, difficult. Uh, uh, opposition yeah i agree i i yeah i was quite happy with how he handled the puck even how he handled himself in the offensive and neutral zones without the puck he knew the right positioning you can tell he's got some hockey sense was he always in the right position no but he knew where he should be and you could tell he tried to hustle to get there when he wasn't and he was always looking for where other people were around him on the ice like he was very aware mm -hmm. of his surroundings uh something i wondered about because i i did notice a, a lack of uh, physicality or finishing checks which you usually see from guys with their first crack at the nhl did you guys see that as well uh, he did finish a few checks, but how would you say, he, because he is a little bit slower, uh, he didn't really have the opportunity to because the puck was already gone. <laughs> so, you know. Didn't I'm, I'm not a, I don't follow the NCAA game, but I'm wondering if the NCAA level of hockey might just be less physical than we're used to seeing. I mean, we're seeing guys come up from the Canadian system and from the AHL where that's already really ingrained in them. And I'm not saying it's non-contact, but I wonder if maybe he doesn't have that same uh, checking expertise, I guess, because it's not, maybe it's not as used in the NCAA. Yeah, and that's why he'll likely need some seasoning in the AHL next year to develop that kind of game as well. Yeah, I uh, I really 
saw thought after the first or after after seeing him that this this kid looks like he could be a uh, a decent player for us, but uh, Troy Ward needs to get his hands on him for at least a couple months and uh, and get him into a little bit more NHL ready shape. And you know, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's fine. And I you know I think I'd keep him up th- for the rest of the season, uh, just just to give him that taste of uh, of game action and give people something interesting to watch. Uh, but yeah. I don't think there's any way he breaks camp with the team next year. But I, I expect to see him back. No, and I, th- I think that's important in a rebuilding franchise, too, to have confidence in those farm teams and to be able to say, okay, we have to send him down there, and that's just part of the development. Yeah. My, yeah. my, my, uh, my question for you guys is because he is a big guy, 6'2", six, six, two, 210, he's, kind of, he's imposing, he's got the crazy hair, although who knows for how long. Um, and I, I wonder if there's going to be a little bit of, uh, I, I, no, not, maybe not pressure is the wrong word, but, uh, I guess maybe an expectation from the fans that he will be a guy who will drop the gloves when needed. But I wonder because he's an NCAA guy, if he's ever going to really develop that aspect of his game, because he's never had to deal with it and he's 22 years old and it's a little bit late at this point to just start fighting. Yeah, because all the leagues that he's ever played in, fighting's been banned. So, you know, he's never really had that in his repertoire. He might take some boxing lessons in the off season, but <laughs> to me, it'd than... be okay if he doesn't fight. I mean, he's not a guy we're bringing in to be a fourth line energy guy. I hope so. I'd no. be okay if that wasn't part of his game. But at the same yeah, like time. I'm... Uh, but at the same time, just having, I guess, the more players you have that are willing to to answer the bell, as it were, uh, I think the harder you are to play it against. Well, I think it's like Jerome. I mean, he was willing to answer the bell when he had to. Is he a good fighter? Yeah. I don't think so. But well, he, when he won all his fights or most of them, Jerome was a Jerome was a really good fighter. But I mean, he didn't fight unless he had to, and I think that you know maybe Hanowski can get to that point where if he has to fight, he can win it. But I don't want him going out there chasing guys down looking for a fight. No, I I, I don't either. But I, at least not necessarily. I I just think uh, I don't know. May, maybe people might uh, expect a guy of his size and especially his role to be in in this day and age maybe a, a bit of a Brandon Press type. Uh and and I you know uh, it's probably I've, yeah, I've heard I, I think Brandon Prust was miscast in that role in Calgary myself, but what it miscast in what role? When Prust was kind of that enforcer type here, he it never seemed like it really fit him as much as they wanted him to do that. I thought Prust had a lot of other talents and could have done more than just be that tough guy here. So I thought it was a bit of a miscast role. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly look at the success he's had since. Uh, since he's left here the second time yeah. like he was invaluable in new york they still miss him right now uh and i, I would credit brandon prest with some uh, with with being as big a part of montreal's turnaround as andre markov alex galchenyuk and brendan gallagher and michel Therrien. like that team plays you know that team plays bigger with brandon prest in the lineup and that, that, that's the only reason I think you know there might be some expectations on a guy like Hanowski in that role as a young player to fight more people just because you know the the camaraderie that team bond you know I think the expectation for him to fight is also going to depend on what next year's roster looks like I mean if you've got a McGratton on the roster I think that need for him or that expectation for him to fight goes way down yeah, yeah I, I, I suppose. But I guess my, my point is just it, it's not that I want necessarily want him to fight. And I have to preface this by this this notion of Hanowski fighting is almost entirely uh, a delusion concocted in my own mind or a narrative concocted in my own mind. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, it, it just seems like a team that has been as perpetually uh, intimidated and dominated physically needs to have not necessarily enforcers but just guys that will not take crap from anyone and if an i don't even i don't know if even know if hanowski is that guy but you know 
Well, and I think those are two very different roles myself. Like, I think we can get Hanowski to the point where he's not going to take crap from anybody, but I don't believe you have to drop the gloves to necessarily be that role. You don't all the time, but it helps to every now and then beat some ass. And every now and then, I think you can get any NHL player to every now and then be able to fight and win. And that, that's all you need. I mean, we we had a guy, we had Avonans, whose job it was to fight and got his ass handed to him in the first fight. So you can you never know who's going to do what, right? Well, I mean, but his his exclusive job was to fight. I mean, everyone... And he failed. He failed at oh, that yeah, job no, no. in the he, first and, game and, of the season. And he was a bad enforcer. But my, my, my point is more that... Um, Look at it this way. Who on the Boston Bruins isn't going to fight? Uh, Krejci, maybe? Uh, Sagan? I think every most people on the Bruins are game for a tussle, and that makes them a, di- a very difficult team to play against. Yager obviously isn't going to fight. Um, uh, the Penguins... Yager's not going to fight. The, the Penguins, yeah, we- in their 24-7 season, the Penguins led the league in fighting majors at the time HBO was shooting that documentary. Um... Fight, fighting, as much as the, the, the reporters uh, uh, might bemoan it, fighting is a very important part of this game. And who on the Flames is game? Well, that's part of the needing good secondary players as well, because you need them to lead, and part of being leaders is not willing to take crap from other teams. Like, um... It's also knowing your role, and when that role means tonight I've got to go out there and I've got to be the fighter, that's what they've got to be willing to do. Yeah, well, like in the Ottawa game tonight, uh, Jared Callen hit uh, Skinner on Carolina, and Chad LaRose, who's like eight inches shorter than Callen, dropped the gloves with him, and, you know, he lost the fight, but, you know, he wasn't willing to see his teammate getting injured you know without a response and we need more of that kind of thing but to to my question who on the current flames roster aside from mcgratton uh do you think does that jackman bejan and you know i could see someone like reinhardt doing that beyond that yeah not so much yeah so and maybe backland too because I've seen him get a little feisty as well. Yeah, and then he was injured for six months. <laughs> I, I will, True. Uh, unfortunately, poor Backlund. We like you. Don't fight. You, you don't. You're brittle. You're you're the Rick DiPietro of of centers. Um, really, like that's that, that therein lies the problem. Like Steve Beja and Tim Jackman and Brian McGrath, the only three guys that, as, and I'll also throw Corey Sarich into this mix, who are game i would say no matter when um all one uh Bejan and jackman aren't great at fighting uh jackman for a guy as big and strong as he is loses a frightening number of fights uh Bejan, uh whatever you, we've discussed him enough for one podcast um the problem is they're all regular healthy scratches this year yeah and well i mean next year they'll be a year older and a year slower and what would what would have changed to make them not regular healthy scratches? Well, I mean, yeah, we don't know what next year's roster is going to look like. I mean, we may need to fill spots. We might need to keep those guys in. Who knows what next year's roster is going to look like? Who knows if those guys are even going to be here next year? I kind of think talking about who fights on the current roster is a bit moot until we see who's going to be around next year. Well, no, I mean, that's but that's my point. Looking at who fights on the current roster, and the answer is three healthy scratches, that seems to me to speak to a need that needs to be addressed. Like, we went out last year and we got Hoodler, Cervenka, and, or Cervenka, and Weidman, and none of them address this grit and toughness and sandpaper aspect that we so desperately lack. And we are going to need that aspect, especially if we're going to be running a bunch of young kids out there. I think, like anything, if you need to fill a role, you have to almost do that from within as well. So maybe part of that key is, okay, those three guys that we mentioned are healthy scratches, so who within the system can step up and play that role? 
Well, we have uh, on defense both Mark Kondari and Chris Breen who have... They can have, both do it. Yeah, they've both shown a, a willingness and aptitude for fighting. Um, amongst the forwards, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, what about Alou? Alou, yeah. If he could ever stay healthy as well, he seems to be oddly brittle for the for both his size and the role he needs to fill in the NHL. The problem with your with the majority, like you, you need to have tough defensemen for sure, but the defensemen need to be able to be that kind of tough and mean in game action and to be able to protect the net. You don't want your defensemen uh, fighting too much because, especially a guy like Breen, who in in Abbotsford plays big big minutes like because then you're losing a minute munching cog of your defense for five minutes uh and i don't want a defenseman up here fighting with regularity unless it's to prove a point send a message don't touch the goalie that sort of thing um there there needs to be i would say at least two players or two two or three players who are regular contributing you know roster players who don't spend half their time in the press box who are not going to stand for our young players getting taken advantage of. Yeah, and that's why like, I wouldn't mind seeing a McGratton type retained, whether it's him or someone else. A guy like Nystrom who could do that. Yeah, like, I agree. We need more of the sandpaper. Make the Flames a pain in the ass team to play against you know like even if you w- beat us we'll you know beat you back <laughs> you know what i mean as much as you want those roles uh filled within the organization those uh, always seem to me to be the types of players you can go out and quite easily fill in free agency and that you know impacts your drafting strategy and that's a whole what was daryl Sutter thinking and that's a whole other kettle of fish but you know that that's just the way I've felt that you should probably construct the team. Yeah. But I, I agree, nice drill. Well, McGratton, I think, should be retained. He's very good at his job, and he's needed. Well, and even of the guys we mentioned, I mean, Chris Breen, Mark Kandari, Akeem Alou, all of those guys are questionable if they'll be back anyways. I mean, they're all RFAs, so the team's going to have to pick who they want and who they don't. Well, I think they're all back. You don't get the, the guy you got for Bowmeister, one of the centerpieces for the Bowmeister deal, you can't let him go just because you haven't seen what he oh, can do. Oh, I think Kandari will be back. Uh, Breen is, I, I don't think that uh, based on everything I've seen from him, and I'm sure the way that uh, uh, Troy Ward uh, talks about him and the way that uh, uh, people in Abbotsford talk about him, he's an NHL-ready defenseman, and he'd probably be up if it wasn't for his injury. Uh, and who was the other guy you'd mentioned? Akeem Alou. Akeem Alou. Akeem Alou is the is the guy I could see them walking away from just because he can't stay healthy. But I do think that were he not made of glass, um, he is exactly the kind of player the team has needed all year. Let me go through the list of RFAs here, and you guys tell me who you see on this list that you'd like to see retained for next year. On the forward side, we've got Michael Backlund, Paul Byron, Akeem Alou, Greg Nemitz, Brian Cameron, Lance Boma, Carter Banks, and Galen Patterson. Who of those forwards would you guys like to see back next year? I'd like to see them walk away from Nemus, Cameron, Banks, and Patterson just because they're taking up roster spots and none of them look like NHL players. And it would be better to try and fill contract spots with guys that might eventually turn into something. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Backland, you know, Backland is, at the moment, he's probably the most valuable center in the organization. So I would imagine, based on the way he's played this year, he's really acquitted himself nicely after last season when it looked like it was his last shot or he was going to be out of the NHL. I think you give him a three-year 1.5 per extension and call that a day. Uh, Byron, uh, doesn't particularly seem to fill a need, uh, he, you know, he's, he's very small, not, I, I don't see that there's a top six roster spot, he's not good enough for that, uh, Alou, as I've mentioned, made of obsidian, 
Uh, Greg Nemish is not an NHL player if he was going to be. Like, the same issues that he had when he was drafted he has now, except now he can't even, he can't score. Uh, Brian Cameron, who cares? Lance Boma, I do see them giving him uh, another year just because he had the injury and he played well the year before. So I think they give him another year to audition and rebound. Carter Banks, uh, you spell your name with a C-K-S, get out. Uh, Galen Patterson, nobody cares. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the forward crop. Of that list, I think I'd take Backlund back. I could take it or leave it on Byron. I mean, he never seems to be able to stick on this roster. They bring him up and they send uh, him down. And... Dude, with Byron, the only uh, reason why I would keep him is to be the the score type leader in a- Abbotsford or Utica or wherever they're playing. Yeah, not so much as like he'll be an NHL player. I, I'd get rid of Alou. I'd get rid of Nemish. Um, Cameron, I'd let go. Boma I'd keep, and contrary to what you guys said, I think I'd keep Carter Banks around. Again, I don't think he's necessarily going to make the team, but I think he could be a solid AHL guy for a year or two. No, I, I, I disagree, but that, the only reason I said it is because I know nothing about him, uh, okay. or, or not, not a lot about him. I saw him play a couple of games in Lethbridge when he was a Hurricane, uh, but on the flip side, that's sort of what the fact that I know nothing about him and I follow this team fairly closely, I think says a lot. Uh, if he was knocking on the door of an NHL opportunity, we would be asking, hey, why haven't they brought Banks up? So, And on defense, the RFAs are TJ Brody, Chris Butler, Brady Lamb, Chris Breen, and Mark Kandari. I keep everybody but Butler. I just let him go. You'd keep Lamb? Yeah, you uh, you br- you brought Brady Lamb in from the NCAA last year, I believe, and I don't think you just you know take a uh, you just, you don't just discard him after one year as a pro. Uh, Chris Butler, however, uh, uh, you can flick him into the wind like a spent cigarette. I don't care. Uh, he has been nothing short of a complete disappointment. Eh, maybe a disaster, and it's not all his fault, but it's just he's not very good and brings nothing to the table. And I think uh, uh, he he could, uh, you know, him never playing for this team again would not result in anyone missing him. Well, like you look at Brett Carson, who came up uh, due to a need, and he hasn't looked any worse than Butler, and he's been in the AHL all year. Yeah. So, like, you can easily just get rid of Butler, replace him with, insert any NHL defenseman, and you will see absolutely no difference. F- finish this. And like, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, you know, like, we need roster spots in the NHL for young defensemen like, say, Kandari or Breen as well, and Butler taking one of those spots means that you don't have room for someone else. I, I asked this question at the beginning of the year when I was full on my Jay Bowmeister hate before he really sort of revitalized his season and career. Uh, name me a memorable play uh, Jay Bowmeister's been involved in in his three years in Calgary. Uh, I will ask that same question to you. Name me a memorable play or uh, a moment when you were like, oh my god, if Butler had been on the ice, that wouldn't have happened, or something to that extent. Yeah... That's, <laughs> yeah. I was originally going to say I'd retain all five of them, but, I mean, we only get six defensemen on a active roster. Well, six that are dressed. And at first I thought, you know what, retain them all. I want Brody back for sure. He has to be re-signed. Kandari's got to be re-signed. Breen, I think they'll bring back. Brady Lamb, I think you're both right. He's actually, I've seen some AHL games, and he's looked better this year. Like, he he's improving every game that I've seen him in. Wasn't he a rookie? Butler... Uh, yeah, but he's playing, I mean, he's played all year in the AHL, right? So I've seen him over time this year, and yeah, I'd bring him back. Um, I saw him in a couple of NCAA games online last year, the year four as well. Okay. And he's definitely improved. But Butler, I could take it or leave it. I could see Butler coming in as a seventh or eighth defenseman. I wouldn't give him an active role. But yeah, I agree with what Matt said. We could slot any free agent 
NHL defenseman into that role as well. So, so why bring him back? It's just sort of like, again, it's a culture shift. Like the guy who's been a part of nothing good here has done nothing memorable in his two years other than he makes $1.25 million. So, I mean, I guess that's good, but, you know, there's no... And even need. that's... Yeah, I, I guess I would look at it for what it might cost. I mean, I wouldn't pay him more than a million if we could bring him back for 600000 Seven fifty at max, maybe to be that seventh defenseman. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, on Brody, uh, Brody's the number one defenseman on this team, so he's gonna. They they better bring him back, otherwise we're gonna com- we're completely screwed. Well, yeah. and I mean Brody's RFA, so if somebody else wants him, in a way, I'm thinking, you know what? If someone else wants him and wants to give us the picks, I you know, don't. Take I don't picks. think anyone's going to take him. Ta- I don't take the picks. I I try to lock him down for three or four years, even. Yeah. I don't. I don't think anyone will take him, and Calgary will match whatever's put out there if it's a reasonable deal. But yeah, if he gets an outrageous deal, take the picks. I don't want to overpay him. I would even keep him, even if we overpay him. <laughs> short, short of anyone, I don't know. Unless we were given a four first round pick offer sheet, which no one's going to give for TJ Brody, hell, no one's going to give a uh, a five million dollar offer sheet for TJ Brody. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to assume that getting him locked up is. I would I would say it's got to be the organization's number one priority heading into. Well, the, the Flames season. have the money to match anything that comes. I mean, if yeah. anyone makes any sort of deal, they've got the cap space to match it. Yeah. So the only well, the only people I, I could I, see doing it would be Colorado, and that's just an fu for the O'Reilly thing. But even then, yeah, I don't like, see Colorado burning that bridge. Yeah, and um, you know, like if they have signed them for like four years at three and a half per, you know, like that would be fair. That's to a both good deal. Sides. You know, because he might not progress beyond this, but, you know, even then he's still a solid number three or four. Yeah, I was going to say, even if he doesn't progress beyond this for 3.5, even if he's in your top four defense, you're still getting a good deal, I think. I I think, though, based on everything I've seen of him, they're, like, he's not playing... And of course, everyone you know, everyone will regress eventually, or or, or everyone can regress. But the st- the way he's playing and the way he's carrying himself does not lead me to believe he's going to be t- taking any major steps back anytime soon. As long as he continues on this trajectory, like I wouldn't worry about him taking steps back. I just worry about him flatlining at some point, perhaps. I mean, I don't think that's a realistic worry, but I don't think he's going to regress backwards. But even if he does flatline. His flat line at this point is a solid three. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what so. we were just talking about, is that even if he flatlines from here, I think he's worth the money, even yeah. if he doesn't go up. I'd agree, and I think that, like, we, we saw that... Like, he's 23. 23-year-olds don't regress. Unless they're Patrick Stefan. I think of that group and putting in guys like... Um, you know, the UFAs, I don't know if you guys would sign uh, Shrevanka or not. Um, Barchi's going to be back, I think. I think that we'll have uh, Reinhardt on the team. There's a good young core ready to go. I think all those guys we mentioned, with maybe the exception of uh, Brady Lamb, I think they're probably ready for the NHL. Whether they're all on the team or not is another story, but... There's a good good young faction competing for a roster spot next year, it sounds like. I think yeah. I think the best thing to do with these young players would not be necessarily to throw them all out at once, but you have your three or four guys, say uh, uh, Sven, Reinhardt, uh, Breen, and maybe one of and I would say maybe your first your first round pick this year uh, are start in the NHL. And then you've got, say, Breen is your next in line. And or Kandari or whoever, and you bring one of them up after about 15 or 20 games, let them play, maybe send them back down, but then you, you sort of ease them all into your rotation so that by the time you get to the end of the year, you have three or four more rookies in your lineup, but because you've not thrown them in all at once, they're all at different stages of their development. Yeah. Well, like, you can't go full on, like, 20 players that are all young. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. it's a disaster. Yeah. Uh, Depending on the scenario, I could even see taking whatever the Flames' first pick is. Or let's say they use all three and we've got three first-round picks. 
I can see quite a few scenarios where those guys don't all make the NHL team this year. I think, you know, some AHL seasoning could be good there. And, heck, I'd even be willing to put that top five pick in the AHL for all or part of the season. Well, you can't. Well, you can't uh, put them in the NHL, but like have them dominate in juniors. Yeah, I th- I think honestly though, especially if we get McKinnon, any of the top five are starting with the team. Um, well, even if we pick seventh and draft Monahan, I don't see how he starts in juniors either. I'll go with you on that. Uh, what about by the time you get to say St. Louis's pick or? Pittsburgh's pick. You it, think those guys are shooting. Oh, they're going it back. depends. It no. It depends on who it is. Like if we pick like a guy like Frederick Gauthier, maybe. But if it's a smaller guy, you'll likely see him go back. It just depends, really. I th- yeah. I think the thing the Flames have that's an advantage over a lot of rebuilding teams is I think people have resigned themselves to. There's not going to be playoffs for a while, so I don't think they're going to have that need to. Let's bring up as much young talent as we can, put on the ice, and try to be competitive in two years. Yeah. Well, I mean, keep in mind, that's not how you be competitive with young talent. No, but that seems to be the model that a lot of these teams are trying to follow. Well, the bad ones. And I think a lot of it's because the they're poor teams, and they've had to. Well, they're also bad yeah. organizations. Like Columbus. Yeah, Washington, I mean, I, I'm even thinking... I'm even thinking the Penguins, right? I mean, they had to bring some revenue into that organization, so they had to make the playoffs and get people interested to bring revenue in at the time when Crosby and Malkin came in. Well, yeah, but Crosby and Malkin, and it's like they drafted Malkin, that was lockout, they draft Crosby, and then the next year they're drafting top three, or they draft, they draft second overall, they picked Jordan Stahl. And I've, maybe the next year was when they took that next, they made the playoffs. Yeah, but, it was. And that was quick, but that was because you had two of the best young players in the world. Uh, and, yeah. And I don't think it was a result of any pressure to make the playoffs per se. I mean, you, you've you already got the foundation of the maybe being the best team in the NHL for the next 15 years on your roster. So there's, I, I think the pressure when that's there and it's self-evident, uh, the pressure goes way down. But I agree with what you're saying. There's going to be no real pressure from fans. I think Tampa playoffs. Bay did that as well with Stamkos. It's okay, Stamkos is in, now we're competitive. You see that quite a bit when a team gets that first overall or even first three or four picks of, okay, we've got the guy we need, now let's go and be competitive. Yeah, but Stamkos, when he went to the Lightning, they were oh God, they, they were one of the ho- most horribly managed organizations in the league. Like there was that the, the, they had the the crazy new owners coming in giving out money to everyone, and people always said like oh they're running it like a fantasy team and it's just like whose fantasy is it to pay Ryan Malone thirty dollars thirty million dollars? Yeah, yeah, and you know yeah I mean I yeah I I don't want to debate who owned what at this point but I've just seen that more often than not when a team gets that pick it's okay we've got the piece we need now let's build around them and get in the playoffs within three years. And I think here we've resigned ourselves. That's not going to happen. So I think that buys us some leeway with what to do with these picks. Well, I mean, all all I'm saying is that it can happen if you do things smartly. But if you anoint your young, uh, recently drafted kids as saviors and try and force responsibility on them that they don't just seize, a la Crosby and Malkin, like Crosby had 100 points in his rookie season. That's, That's being undeniable. Uh, I think being smart with those kids can be send them back to junior for another year. Yeah, oh, yeah, and uh, I, I would say that I I don't think that there's much chance, barring a a top ten pick that falls to the St. Louis pick. Um, I don't think there's much chance that any of the second or uh, any of the two or three picks that we make in the first round uh, start with the team. I don't I don't think that's good for the team. I don't think it's good for their development. Because they're they'd be coming into a situation where you know there's upwards of six or seven rookies on the team, and that isn't going to work. No, like you need to stagger them. Yeah, and once again to go back to the Oilers and how much they suck, uh, they threw the uh, they threw Taylor Hall and Jordan Eberle into the fire, and both Taylor Hall and Jordan Eberle had forty point seasons in the rookie year, which is not bad, but you can't. 
expect those guys to be on the same level of a Crosby who comes in and puts up 100 points. Yeah. That's all. And there's, I mean, there's always going to be drafts where a guy gets lucky. And I think we all know that, yeah, Crosby was that one. I mean, that's why he was being called the next one. And no one's expecting to get that this year. But maybe I used a bad analogy with Crosby, and that's why I backpedaled to Stamkos. I mean, he's not all that special. But you see that more often than not, where a team makes decisions based on now as opposed to what's right for the long term. Yeah. And that's why we need to be patient. <laughs> Well, Stamkos, in his defense, proved everybody wrong, and he was pretty freaking special. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to continue. I don't know if he can do 10 years of that. I'm not sold on him, but... He scored 50 goals, what? Two, he, he scored them two straight years, and then last year... Or this year, he's what? Still? In one of the... That's the same division where Jay Bomeister looked like a star, too. Uh-huh. Ovechkin plays in that division. I mean, you know... You don't fluke your way into 50 goals unless you're Jonathan Chichu. You certainly do, don't do it twice. I mean, he, he is a shoot first. Sure, and, 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 and I'm not debating. He's he's a good hockey player. That's why you go in the you know number one or two or whatever he went. But I just, I'm not convinced he's a superstar for his whole career. He's good now. Don't get me wrong. He's a good player. But I don't think he's good enough to single-handedly get you to the postseason. I'm not sure that when he's 30, he's still going to be putting up those kind of numbers. He's 22. So, you know. But, okay, this is, uh, we're, we're slightly sidetracking here. But, I mean, I'm curious, why, why don't you think that? I just, I look at his play and he's, I don't know, there's something about him that I just don't, I don't think is going to last. And we can get into this another time, or you and I can debate this off the air, because we are getting sidetracked, but I just, I have a feeling that he's not going to be the superstar. Well, how would you say, to me, he was reminiscent of Brett Hull, where he'll put up huge goals, but he's not going to be your primary guy. And, like, if he's, like, your, if you've got a team, like, say, like, the Red Wings when they won their cup in 02, um, Hull was not the guy. Like, Iserman was still the guy, and Hull was the secondary player who would just be off to the side hammering the puck home. So, you know what I mean? Like... Well, if if he's anything, he's the top sniper, and I mean, you can say Brett Hull. Brett Hull is the second greatest goal scorer in NHL history. Yeah, and that's what I mean. But like, he's not going to single handedly win you a cup. That's what I'm getting at. Okay, but you don't, you know, he's still a. He's a very. He's like an elite secondary guy. Is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I just look at what he's accomplished thus far, especially considering the circus of his rookie year. And, you know, who who knows how much... Like, keep in mind, he he scored 50 goals playing uh, playing the 1-3-1. He did it twice. You know? I, I think we're going to have to all agree to disagree on Stamkos. Okay. Tweet us your thoughts, Calgary, and the world. Internet. At Luke seventeen oh one L U C one seven zero one. All right. Anything else you guys want to get into this week? Yeah, we got enough topics for next week. So this is a long podcast. This might be the longest we've done since the pilot. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, then let's uh, sign off. As always, we encourage people to head over to the website firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook. And tell your friends, uh, tell Flames fans you know about us. We'd love to have them come listen to us. Until next week, this is Dan, Matt, and Lucas signing off. Suck it, Tom. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.